morning, everyone. This is Rob Behrens, the new Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. And a warm welcome to the very first edition of Radio Ombudsman, our new podcast. Now, Radio Ombudsman is designed as one important channel to open up dialogue and engagement with our users and stakeholders and with all those with an interest in the development of the Ombudsman Office in this country and around the world. The point of Radio Ombudsman is to involve as many people as possible in our developing thinking about an institution which this year celebrates its 50th birthday. Now, we were set up as an independent, impartial service of last resort, and we have spent a long time adjudicating cases that come to us. But in the 21st century, we need to do more. We've got to get better at communicating with complainants, better at learning from bad experiences, and better at using early resolution and mediation so that we possibly don't have to use adjudication at all. On a regular basis, I'm going to be inviting people with important and interesting ideas and relevant experience into our studio, either here in London or in Manchester, to join me in an open, recorded, but unedited conversation. And to help make the process lively and relevant, we've invited people on Twitter to send in questions for our guests. And straight away, I want to thank Jade Taylor on Twitter for asking if the podcast will broadcast only what she calls the tiny number of voices it investigates, hand-picked voices. And the answers to that are that we will be inviting a very wide range of guests and certainly not confining ourselves uh, to those people who complain to us. Now, today's guest is Scott Morrish, photographer, father and patient, distinguished campaigner, now working on patient safety, based on personal experience, but critically and crucially going wider than that in terms of the learning. Scott, you're extremely welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. When did you first become involved with the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman? Uh, That would have been early in 2012, which at that point was maybe 14 or 15 months after um, Sam, my my youngest son at the time, died. Okay. And uh, why did you become involved with the Ombudsman Service? Uh, Well, I guess I didn't want to. Um, I, I would rather not have come to the Ombudsman Service, but was basically in a position where I could make no progress with the NHS in understanding why Sam had died and why um, I was unable to get any answers about it and there was nowhere else to go. So the advice I was given against almost every instinct in me was to bring a complaint to the Ombudsman. Okay. And uh, this began a long and protracted involvement with the Ombudsman Service, didn't it? Yeah, I I guess it spans somewhere between four and five years in terms of being an active complainant. Um, And that was split into two very different chunks of time, um, maybe two and a half years or or thereabouts in the first investigation. Um, And then somewhere approaching two years locked in a second investigation. And um, they were both very different processes and they were both looking at different issues, but they were both focused around Sam's death and the NHS's response to it. And can you describe for us uh, what the investigations were like to experience? Oh, well, that's tough in the sense that the first one was probably the bleakest experience um, after Sam's death. And because it dragged on through the best part of two and a half years, it was harrowing for a prolonged period of time. And the second one was very different. It it wasn't easy, but it was a lot easier. 
it had a different character, it had a different methodology. Um, we were involved in a very different way and felt much more engaged with that process and therefore, although still difficult because of the subject matter and, and the history behind it, um, it was a far more manageable process. Why do you think there was this difference? What, what happened to, to, to change it? Um, well, I guess the adverse publicity after the first one is probably the reason the second one was different. Um, and it wasn't a typical PHSO investigation. It wasn't undertaken by people that worked with a history inside the PHSO. And it drew upon methodologies that I don't think the PHSO had the capacity to deliver at that time. So... As far as the first investigation was concerned, were you involved in 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 consultation about the drafting of the recommendations? And um, with the first investigation, um, I would say we were involved in everything we could be involved in from the minute it started until the minute it was published. But that was limited by the involvement that we were allowed. So we chose to intervene every time we thought something was either missing or wrong. And uh, we were always given opportunities to uh, give feedback and we always used them. Um, but it was not in our gift to determine what went in. All we could do was say what we thought mattered and hope that the PHSO did the right thing. And the second uh, case was different in the way which which it was handled? The second case was very different, um, partly benefiting from everything that had been learned through the first one, and partly because I think there was a real desire not to replicate the mistakes of the first one. And in a sense, you, you, could, you can think of the second one as being completion of the first investigation. My objections with the first were not that it was fundamentally wrong, they were that it was knowingly incomplete. And my objectives in pursuing a second investigation were to complete something that, if left unfinished, was going to leave gaping holes in understanding of what had happened after Sam died. Knowingly incomplete is a, is a powerful expression. Uh, I've seen a lot of comments on Twitter and since I took up post about the lack of impact of our investigations yes what, what, what's what do you have to say about that um well i relate to those uh those comments and empathize with the people who are feeling that it's impossible to alter or impact upon what the ombudsman is doing um because that's exactly how i spent you know a big chunk of certainly the first two and a half years and, and some of the time after that um, I think the Ombudsman has allowed itself to be, become a hostage of its own processes and I think that's where a huge number of the problems that people like us experience originate from but unfortunately when we try and deal with them the attempt to answer our questions tends to involve going back to the process so it becomes a vicious circle one that is very very hard to break I've I've read evidence that you've given to the public administration and constitutional uh, affairs committee where you've talked about this and you've talked about the importance of transparency in the investigation yeah as a way of making sure that it doesn't become a hostage of its own processes. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit about what you mean by that? Well, if we take a step back and look at how the processes may have originated, I think perhaps when the Ombudsman Service was set up, it was set up in an age where deference was perhaps the norm towards authority and um, diffidence may also have played a, a role. And I think both of those things are things of the past. And uh, trust is eroded so heavily now in many aspects of government and authority that 
it's not enough now just to, to assure people that you're trustworthy. You actually have to demonstrate that you're trustworthy. And actually, you can't do that by um, resorting to a process that is designed behind closed doors, that's monitored behind closed doors, that is basically beyond any form of scrutiny. Um, and obviously, when you've watched your son die, and you know there are questions that are unanswered, it's nigh on impossible for you or anybody else to convince me that the questions that I think need answering are irrelevant. The process can't address those things. So would you question the principle of impartiality of the Ombudsman? No, impartiality is vital. Um, if, you're in part, if, if you are in danger of sacrificing impartiality, you're doing the wrong thing. Um, impartiality is absolutely vital because you shouldn't be on my side, but neither should you be on the side of the person I may have complained about or the process I may have complained about. What you should be on the side of is unearthing all of the evidence and that is always possible in an impartial way. Uh, do you think that a greater transparency compromises the confidentiality of the process? I, I, well, I would argue that the, the process should not be confident, <laughs> confidential. And I think sometimes it's easy to get tangled up with these sorts of conversations. I think actually what is necessary is um, transparency unless there is an absolutely compelling reason to be anything but transparent. So the default should be transparency. In the past, the default has been the complete opposite of that. I, I agree with you that uh, transparency is a key ingredient of, of trust and that uh, deference and diffidence are values that, that have gone and we need to, to get rid of. I don't uh, instantly agree with the view that confidentiality should disappear because there's always more than one side to a particular uh, issue in a complaint. I'm specifically not saying that confidentiality should be a thing of the past. I'm saying that transparency should be the default and confidentiality has a role to play, but only when it is necessary, not by habit. And that would change the terms that complainants and complainees can then engage with the PHSO on. The assumption should be that everything will be shared with everybody because we're trying to resolve whatever dispute there is and hopefully learn from it and avoid it happening again. When there are issues that are genuinely in need of confidentiality, then of course that should be offered. And I would argue that's in everybody's best interest, including the person making the complaint. Um, it's not binary, it's not either or. You can have a default that leans heavily towards transparency you can offer confidentiality when it's necessary and I would argue any trusting relationship has to have the capacity for both of those things okay <clears throat> now just looking back and summarizing uh, what what are, what are the general criticisms you would make of the case handling in the two cases because I've heard you talk about your respect for the case handlers yeah. but your sense that they were ill-equipped to deal with the situations they were asked to look at? Um, I have uh, respect for all people that are asked to do a job, um, but I don't necessarily respect the job they're asked to do. And in this case, the complaint, the complaints handlers were always courteous. They were always professional. They were never rude. Um, I think they were sometimes exasperated with me, but then so is my wife. Um, the thing that always seemed or increasingly seemed to be apparent to me was that I think sometimes they could have done a lot more and perhaps would have done a lot more if the process hadn't stopped them from doing so and of course from the outside it's hard to know quite how the process was doing that um, but there were so many decisions that were made not to investigate and not to look at certain things not to interview people not to pursue certain lines of inquiry um, that really did make no sense that I was left feeling that perhaps they were in a very perverse way just as powerless as I was Do you think it would have helped if there had been an extensive engagement with you on a personal basis at the beginning of the process? 
I think the more complex the situation and the longer um, the period of time it spans, um, the, the, the greater the need for direct contact at an early stage, simply because it's the only real way of feeling your way through the situation that you're in and sense checking every part of your understanding of it. If I, if I was in their shoes, I would want to meet simply because I would be keen to know that I had the best understanding of it. I think to default to letters and emails and the occasional telephone call just is tying your hands behind your back and throwing away a huge opportunity to understand the situation that you're in. So were you invited to come in and talk to the case handlers? Uh, no, I had to push for them to come to me. Um, at the time, I wasn't in a fit state to come to London, to be honest, and or Manchester. Um, so I asked for the interviews, um, and we got halfway through everything that had happened to Sam in the first interview. Then the time had run out, and it was time to get back on a train. We had to push for a second meeting to be able to complete that process. Um, but the default was very much to handle it by email, to handle it by letter, to make phone calls when necessary. But it, the expectation wasn't to sit down with us and understand. After an experience like the loss of your son, as you said, the last thing you would want to do would be to make a complaint. And yet the, the process of the Ombudsman seems to put a premium on investigating in time. Yeah. So uh, complainants, when they're at their, their lowest, are often asked to go through hoops which people not in that position would find difficult anyway. But if it's not looked at, then uh, time moves on and people's memories and documents fade away. So there's a dilemma there, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of not wanting to complain, I actually I felt like I was betraying the people that had tried to help Sam by agreeing to become a complainant. It was, it was the opposite of everything I thought should be happening. Um, it was quite a painful thing to do. I had gone to see my MP and I felt like I was betraying all the people that tried to help Sam then too. I never wanted to go and say, look, the NHS is failing to do the right thing and it's apparently indifferent to this thing that's happened to our family. Um, but actually the NHS left me with no choices and I never wanted to go to the law. I never wanted to go to the press. And the only other option that anybody presented to me was the Ombudsman. Um, but the hoops that you have to jump through, the knowledge that the, the bar you have to clear is so high, is incredibly intimidating at the same time that you might just be wondering if you're going to wake up the next day. It's an inhumane way to treat a family that's gone through those things. So this took many years yeah. of your life and your family's life. Um, were you ever tempted to give up? <laughs> um, giving up isn't something that's in my nature um, but it also caused that that in itself is a is an interesting point because my wife didn't want me to complain either with the first or the second time um, if somebody could have just sat down and said sorry she would have been able to move on um, and I know she would have still campaigned around sepsis but she did not feel that we should be dealing with the inadequacies of a complaint system or the inability to investigate. In her view, that was very much a case of um, the res other people's responsibilities. So, although it, in the end I couldn't have walked away or given up because I, I knew that you know if I lived to be 50 or 60 and I read a headline that read anything like our story, I would be knowing that I had colluded to some extent by not, not tackling it. And I wasn't ever going to feel comfortable doing that. Okay. Um, David Drew uh, on Twitter, a whistleblower, has sent in a question to you uh, which says, uh, Scott, the Ombudsman has been instrumental in publishing the truth about the way the NHS failed your family. Hmm. You are part of a small minority to have achieved this. A huge number of dispossessed relatives are still pursuing the truth. Um, 
what should be done to to address this, what he calls epidemic of suffering? Well, I guess my first thought is the shame on the system. Um, shame on the system for allowing this to be the case. And by that, I don't just mean shame on the PHSO, I mean the whole system, because the only reason I needed to come to the PHSO was because the NHS had failed itself. Um, so there is a deep reservoir of hurt out there with people having experiences like ours and, and in some cases experiences like ours that go back over two or three decades mm -hmm. and no resolution, no recognition, an awful lot of animosity. And um, firstly, I think the need, there's a real need to recognise the that reality for all of those people. And secondly, I think once it's been recognised, then there should be an attempt to address it. And I think there are two different elements of that from the Ombudsman Service's perspective. One being that learning should come from whatever it is that's led to the situation. But the second thing is, I think, the system as a whole needs to deal with historic cases. I don't think it's necessarily a thing the Ombudsman can do on its own. But somebody in the Department of Health needs to figure out a route forward for all of the people that have become trapped in the histories of their cases. Can we move on to use your experience uh, to look at the learning and policy development that the Ombudsman needs to take on board uh, in order to be more professional and better at and trusted at doing its job. And there's been <clears throat> a whole host of um, points and questions made on Twitter relating to this, for which I'm, I'm grateful. So uh, Ken Lowndes, for example, um, Ken Zero Harm, uh, makes the point that there's so much available already that uh, he wonders why we're asking for more information about how we could do things better because he says it's already out there. On the other hand, um, naughty person uh, tweets to say when and how can a proper complaint system be put in place. The vulnerable who are damaged by the NHS have nowhere to turn. And prescription for life in the same vein uh, says how will the PHSO address the willful blindness, ignorance portrayed in complaints and uh, staff involved. So there are a lot of people who agree with you that uh, how uh, PHSO goes about looking at uh, complaints is not satisfactory. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of different threads to it because um, you almost need to go all the way back to the beginning and ask what is the purpose of the Ombudsman? What is the Ombudsman trying to achieve? And I think perhaps historically it was set up specifically with the goal of judging whether a complaint was valid or not, either finding in its favour or finding against it. Um, but we're in a we're at a point in time now where what's needed is something much is much more than that, much more complex than that as well. And um, people like me, uh, well, I'll speak purely in, my, in in terms of my own story. I didn't care whether you upheld my complaints or not actually because I knew where the injustices were and I even more than that I knew where the gaps were in anybody's knowledge um, they were writ large in the form of all the questions nobody would answer so really what I think is needed now is uh, a mechanism for learning and a mechanism for investigating and certainly in my case the only reason, the only reason for complaining was because those things did not exist so if the purpose of a complaints process is to further learning and therefore to drive improvement, I would suggest you need 
very different processes to the ones that were put in place in order to, to form a judgment. And trust is one element that's lacking but necessary. Competence is another. And that has to be tied up with the processes that you put in place. At the moment, I think processes have been put before people. And the consequences are injustice. And I think the processes have also become detached from the purpose. And that's fundamental in my mind, because if the goal is learning, you need processes that are capable of getting you there. And I just don't think the Ombudsman has had them. Well, I agree with a lot of what you say. Clearly, uh, the key aim of the Ombudsman Service should be resolution of disputes that can't be resolved um, in, an, in a trust or a hospital or, or a body in jurisdiction. That is one element of it. That is different and supplementary to adjudication, which... Uh, involves uh, a judgment about whether or not there's merit in one person's case. So I accept that resolution is different from adjudication. But you need to have resolution because that's what some people want. In your case, that, that wasn't necessarily what you wanted. You wanted learning from uh, the system to make sure that... Uh, the gaps could be filled, that professionalism could be uh, guaranteed in, in the service delivery. Now, uh, hasn't the Ombudsman Service moved some way in the last five or six years by uh, introducing the idea of an insight report, which builds on cases and looks at lessons to be learned in policy development um, in ways which enable policy makers to address the very issues that you're talking about. Yes, I think insight is key and insight reports, if evidenced, are incredibly valuable tools. Um, I suppose the point I was trying to make just now was that in my case, were the the judgment upheld my complaint or not wasn't of primary interest to me. Um, resolution, actually, as, a, as distinct from judgment, was. Um, but I think there's been a tendency, if you look through what's been happening in select committees and um, various forms of communication from the Ombudsman, there has been this idea that more complaints will lead to more learning and therefore a better service. And actually, if the, if the complaints process is primarily, above all other things, interested in the robustness of his adjudication, all those other things that it's talking about fall by the wayside. And the processes, if they are purely focused on a robust adjudication, can leave all kinds of holes in knowledge and understanding, which are where you get these comments regarding willful blindness from. If you say, actually, I don't need to look any further because we've already upheld, upheld your complaint, then you're accepting ignorance in a certain area that may be of fundamental value. You can't know unless you look. Well, I, I take that point, but would you take this point that the Ombudsman is accountable to the rule of law? Yeah. And while people say the Ombudsman is not accountable, in fact, uh, people who regard the decision as deficient in some way can yeah. go to a court and say this is an unsatisfactory uh, investigation. So... We, we can't uh, not seek to have rigorous adjudication. You should seek rigorous adjudication, but you shouldn't settle purely for rigorous adjudication. I was told time and time again through my first investigation that we had reached a robust adjudication and therefore we will not go further, which basically meant there was no point in the second investigation. The second investigation probably revealed more useful information than the first, but it was deemed unnecessary at the point that the first one was signed off by the Ombudsman. There was a massive hole 
in the knowledge that was gathered through that first investigation. And it's there. A lot of it is there in the second report. So by definition, a robust adjudication can leave holes in knowledge. Um, the, the reason I mentioned purpose, po you know, you've got people and process and purpose. If the purpose of the ombudsman is purely to reach a robust adjudication, that takes you down one process route. If the purpose is also to hold the systems accountable for improvement beyond simply arriving at a judgment as to whether a complaint is valid or invalid, you have to go further. And that needs a different methodology. And that, to some extent, is what was different between the first and the second investigations that, that I saw. You say that the Ombudsman must be independent, yes. but there should be an independent review of what the Ombudsman does, which is not a judicial one. It will, yeah, I mean, picking up on the idea of accountability in the form of the judiciary, I can't think of any greater injustice that could be heaped upon a family than to say, after you've gone through everything with a service like the Ombudsman, actually, if you're not happy, now turn to law. Um, I will never do that. I would never have done that. And I don't think it's just for a family that's gone through those sorts of experiences to have to take those sorts of steps in order to make an organisation accountable. I think it's the wrong mechanism. I actually think it's deeply damaging to the reputation of the Ombudsman too. Um, now, it's not the Ombudsman's fault if that's the structures that have been written into primary legislation, but it doesn't mean it's right for the future. And uh, I think it may well be an area that needs need judging. Now, it should be right that you can, can turn to law if you need to, but I think you need something else as well. <coughs> And well, that and that something else um, has to be focused perhaps less around structures like the law and more around ideas like restoration. So it's a question of trying to resolve differences, trying to reach understandings, trying to share understandings, trying to have a contextual shared consciousness of, of the whole system so that if, if differences remain, we can understand what they are and maybe even accept and respect them even though those differences may remain. That, so, that's not possible in a, in a judicial setting. Well, a couple of points that come out of that. First of all, what you seem to be saying is something along the lines that you need to have an element of mediation in dispute resolution in order to properly address uh, the differences between the two sides. Yes, um, mediation, a trusted broker that can help um, people with legitimate different uh, ideas and opinions to sit down and find a way forward if that's possible. It may not always be possible, but I think we could do much better than we do at the moment. Okay, well we can agree on that, but I'm not sure we can agree on the issue of non-judicial independence. So independent review. So a number of people on Twitter have raised the question, when will Rich Squints, for example, when will PHSO get an expert independent review of a number of key failed cases? And some people on Twitter point to the fact that you, you had, you were offered an, an element of independent review. Well, that, our second investigation wasn't an independent investigation. It was conducted by the PHSO um, on the PHSO's terms. It wasn't independent. It was very much a PHSO investigation. It was just deploying a methodology and a team that were not typically PHSO. But in terms of um, external review, I suppose why I was trying to suggest a while back that you might need something driven by the Department of Health rather than the PHSO itself is because these historic cases are now very complicated. I don't know that the PHSO could cope with them on its own. But the state has created these injustices for a number of families. And the state is the level at which it needs to be recognised and actually they are the only people that can provide redress where that's possible. So there needs to be a system-wide approach to trying to resolve as many historic cases as can be, or at least to recognise them and learn from them. I, I was a 
UK civil servant who worked uh, in South Africa during the transition from apartheid and I watched the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, are you talking about something like that? I don't pretend to have an exact model in mind. Um, I guess I feel as an ordinary patient it's okay to recognise a need or a deficiency in the system and to suggest that we need to be creative and imaginative in looking for a way to solve that problem. And it is an example that springs to mind, the truth and reconciliation approach, whereby you don't necessarily tie it to punishment. You primarily set out to allow people to air their injustices as they've experienced them and to seek learning and resolution where possible, with, with a view primarily to being then free to move forward. And that's what the, the, this backlog of historic cases is preventing. It's preventing the individuals from, from being able to move forward in their lives, but it's therefore preventing the PHSO and other parts of the NHS from moving forward too, because this legacy is going to anchor them to the past. That's one thing, but a related issue I, I'm more sceptical about, and you talk about the ombudsman marking his or her own home, homework... Yeah. And a number of people are asking not for a view of historic cases, but of contemporary cases, yeah. if they don't get the outcome that they think they deserve. Now, I'm interested in your view on this, because my view is that with no power of coercion, with no ability to be able to impose uh, a recommendation on a body in jurisdiction. We are the body of last resort for a complainant and that it is inappropriate to offer anything else after that fact, providing that we have reached an evidence-based um, decision. Now, you, you don't agree with that, do you? Um if I've understood that correctly, I think the, the, the point my understanding has reached is that if the process has allowed an investigation to follow a particular path and it's reached a point in which it's convinced it has a, road just, a robust adjudication and it can defend it legally, then it may think its job is finished. But during the course of that process, it may have completely missed some factors which are fundamental from the complainant's perspective. And that's where we come back to the idea of the process and those early meetings in order to sense check what the purpose of the complaint is. And I think there are many, many examples um, whereby the process itself has revealed information that if it had been known at the outset, outset could have perhaps framed a complaint differently and that might have led the ombudsman down a different route. Now at the moment the ombudsman's processes are so rigid and so inflexible that it's very hard for them to go back. It's not an iterative process, it's very much a linear process or at least that's how it seems. We're going to tick this box, tick this box, tick this box and now we've got a robust defensible set of findings so we're going to leave it there. That, that isn't how families live. Well, we, we have a new service charter now, we have a new operating model, and I am uh, determined to make sure we are more responsive to the needs of complainants in the course of looking at a case, providing that we don't lose our impartiality and providing that we don't lose our independence. Yeah. And I, I, I can't... I disagree with the view that there should be a super ombudsman to um, mark the homework of the ombudsman. No. I think that w that is bureaucratic. It brings us into disrepute. It makes us into a second-class ombudsman service. That's not what people should want. What they should want is an exemplar an exemplary yes. uh, process in the first place. Well, have, having spent quite a few years involved with an ombudsman's process, um, I wouldn't want to then have to go to another ombudsman. <laughs> so, and um, The last thing I think the world needs is another one. Um, but actually, the, the, the key, the currency you're in short supply of is, is trust. Yeah. What you're lacking is 
a sense that you're trustworthy, uh, not you personally, but the Ombudsman Service as a whole. And this comes back to the fact that we're in an age that's post-deference and post-diffidence. And therefore, what we need to do is think, how do we how do we create an Ombudsman Service for the future in which trust is easy, in which trustworthiness can be demonstrated? And, and my suggestion would be that far, far from the idea of a, a super Ombudsman, we actually put a mechanism in place whereby... If you reach an impasse as a complainant or as an ombudsman, you can basically refer that case in full to a third party who can look at it with real objectivity because they have no involvement in it and no interest in its outcome other than making sure it's good. And then those its analysis can be fed back both to the complainants and also the ombudsman. Now, if the ombudsman is as good as it's hoping to be, it should be able to see this as belts and braces that enshrines its independence and its integrity, and actually, it should be able to. It should be big enough and humble enough to accept any criticisms that come back, as long as it is then tasked with correcting any deficiencies. But equally, if what comes back is uh, a vote of confidence in its findings, then that should also then give reassurance to the families involved. Well, uh, I let's see where we uh, agree. On this, trust is an absolutely critical issue for all public bodies, particularly uh, the ombudsman. And trust involves at least three key elements being honest, being seen to be honest, uh, being competent, and being trustworthy. And None of those things are achievable without the Ombudsman Service being transparent. So I, I sign up to all those things. And one of the ways in which we need to be more competent is through what is called in the trade structural impartiality. Yeah. That's what the Canadians call it. That is that you use people who have the emotional intelligence to be able to understand and work with people who are stressed or bereaved yeah. in some way and we haven't been terribly good at that so I, I, I share that I also share the view that mediation can be uh, a tool um, as part of the resolution process in a way in which this particular ombudsman service hasn't used it very much yeah where, where I disagree with you is whether or not this should be outside the, the institution or not. Yeah. Um, but perhaps that's something we can continue to, to, to debate. Well, if, if we were in a different place in terms of public confidence, I might disagree with myself on this. But we are where we are. Yeah. And trust is at rock bottom in some people's minds. Yeah. So my question is simply, how do you intend to rebuild trust with those that have reason to doubt and any form of marking your own homework is going to leave scope for cynicism so I think if you're confident that what you're doing is right um, then this other form of scrutiny that I'm suggesting will bolster your drive forward but it will actually help re you know retain focus within the ombudsman service on what really matters and, it, and you know you're talking about trust in terms of components it's competence it's honesty it's integrity in my mind and transparency is one of the factors that will one of the, the means by which you can deliver a, an increase in trust it's not an answer in itself but i don't mean trust i don't mean transparency about process yeah i mean transparency about what you find and how you arrive at your recommendations, and why you don't pursue some lines of inquiry, and why you do do you tackle others. Okay. Um, can we move on to talk about an absolutely fundamental issue, which is the culture in the health service? Yes. Yeah. Um, and there is a perception of a defensive culture in the health service which makes it difficult to get resolution of uh, issues at the first tier hmm. and uh, which means that investigations or mistakes before investigations are not acknowledged. Yeah. Now there's been some attempt to address this through 
uh, uh, legislation and uh, the duty of candor. Um, but we've got a long way to go, uh, all of us, to be sure that there is a culture of learning, or what you call a just culture, yeah. in the health service. What, what's your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, it's incredibly complicated, and because of the complexity, I think it puts a lot of people off getting on with fixing this. But it also sometimes leads people down um, partial routes to success. So the duty of candour, for example... Um, may or may not help. I think it probably helps in some cases and it may hinder in others. It's not clear-cut. Um, learning culture is something I think before Sam died, I had simply assumed that healthcare was rooted in scientific thinking. I had assumed, therefore, that if a problem arose, it would try and solve the problem and that, by definition, it would want to learn. And that's partly why when I ask simple questions, layman's questions about what I had just seen happen in front of my eyes, um, I, w I was so shocked by the reticence, the reluctance, the defensiveness. And um, in a sense, that's why I'm here now still, because no matter what reports have been written, I know at grassroots level, most of those issues remain unaltered at grassroots level for most people and I guess my hope is that by untangling what culture means and what shapes it we can actually bring about change faster than most people would dare to think is possible um, the just culture I think is the key thing and if people feel afraid to be asked questions let alone answer them honestly it tells you that they don't feel free to admit their mistakes and that means that their team, the people around them, can't learn. And whilst that's the case, we're just going to keep on having stories like this. So I've, I've read that you've um, used the phrase that culture eats strategy. Yeah. And this is about leadership Yes. Uh, at all levels in the NHS. Yes. So, how how do we empower uh, clinicians and administrators in in the health service and other bodies to become more self-critical at the point in which they're under huge pressure? Uh, and they're having to exercise their professional judgments all the time. We stop punishing them for being human. We stop punishing them for making mistakes. Um, we stop creating circumstances in which mistakes end up being aired in NMC hearings and splashed across the fronts of newspapers. We create an environment where people feel psychologically safe to say... I think I've made a mistake and then to explain it and have it scrutinized in the interest of improving and, and growing and that requires um, much more than just leadership it, leadership on its own is is one key element but you need good governance you need accountability and at the moment all three th all three areas are, are lacking in too many places um, you need everybody to be engaged but you need everybody to feel empowered and right now I think the complaints process is the perfect example of a system and a process that disempowers, it disengages, it drives us apart, it, it takes us in the wrong direction in, in most cases. Um, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be complaints processes, but it should not be the default. It's a very unhealthy default, and it speaks volumes about the culture that we have right now. So you're, um, you're, you've been working with regulators in the health service to look at some of the issues outside of complaints I, I'm not, I, I mean that sounds far too um, serious, I'm not working with anybody um, but I am certainly trying to engage with those people I think are shaping the service that we have and that means um, soon I hope to be speaking uh, with some people in the GMC and I will strive to, to speak with others too but basically 
I've come to the conclusion at the moment that the regulation we have is a big part of the problem. It's too slow. It's too legalistic. Its focus isn't learning. It's punitive far more often than it's restorative. And I think there is such a wide spectrum of things that go wrong and reasons that people suffer. But we seem to have a one-size-fits-all response, which is basically a complaints form. And actually what we need is a whole suite of responses. It, involve, it would involve mediation, and in, in some cases, restorative approaches where possible. Punishment should just be one, and it should be the rare example. But at the moment, it's almost a form of brinkmanship, as if here's a complaints form, we'll either uphold and somebody might get punished, or, or nothing is going to happen. The status quo is pretty much nothing happening. And will the healthcare safety investigation branch contribute to this diversity of uh, approaches? Because it's not a complaints handling body, is it? No, it's quite deliberately not a complaints handling process. Um, it should never be confused with that in any, in any shape or form. Um, it will definitely help, but it's not the solution to all of the problems. What it will do is, I hope... And reveal the system-wide nature of problems in whichever areas it chooses to investigate. That's another capability that the, the system just has not had in the past, and it's high time and, and a good thing that it's happening now. Um, but it's part of a long-term uh, mechanism for keeping the system in, in a space where it learns and can scrutinise itself without any of those elements of fear and punishment. I mean, there are a lot of regulators in the health service, and one of the key issues is that they are all joined up and and uh, understand what each other does, do, and 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 work constructively together. And is that beginning to happen? Um, on the way up to this recording, I was thinking about what I think the biggest problem in the whole system is, and actually I think it's silos. Yeah. And I think each regulator is a silo of its own. And it sort of left me wondering if, in, you know, we have an NHS, a national health service in name, but in practice we have a siloed health service. And I actually think that's the hub of the almost every problem I've encountered. It's silos within silos. And the regulators are... are hampered by that on one level, but within a hospital, within the hospital where Sam died, you've got many, many silos, different departments, different specialities, different hierarchical silos and different disciplinary silos. And I think each of those silos is the reason that communication doesn't just morph across the whole system. And, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to take a bit longer to understand that properly, but I think when the regulation mirrors the dysfunctionality of the rest of the system, we're in a bad place. And actually, that's where I think we are right now. Well, Scott, you, you've been balanced, frank, bleak, uh, rooted in experience, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, as a way of finishing, are there any reasons to be hopeful that there's a way forward uh, for the Ombudsman and changing the culture in the health service yes um, I haven't meant to be bleak actually um, but there are always reasons to be hopeful it's a reason for remaining engaged and the key thing I guess I'm looking for at the moment when I know I can sit back and think I've done what I needed to do is to start seeing evidence that the situation that we have experienced is properly understood and the problems that we have encountered are properly articulated. And then there are at least theories about how we might solve them. So I'm looking for solutions to these problems. And I'm looking for like-minded people that want to solve these problems. And um, I think the, the, the measure for me is when patients and staff are, are talked about in the same breath and their interests are aligned and they're not pitted one against the other as is often the case in something like a complaints process. So we're looking for a culture where the leadership displays humility, where it has empathy for everybody under its sphere of influence. We're looking for systems that are resilient and adaptable and supportive. And basically, 
patients and staff feeling empowered, empowered to be honest about what has happened to them. And I think when we start moving in that direction and start seeing that actually happening, then trust will emerge. It will be the flower on on this particular plant. Um, it might all sound a bit vague and a bit dreamy, but uh, it's my reason for being hopeful, believing that that is possible. Scott Morris, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening to Radio Ombudsman. We'd love to know what you think, so please leave a review or comment. If you like what you hear, please share and subscribe for